talking to Larry Kellum. All right, Larry, before we get into the good stuff, let's just get some background information. Can you tell me where you were born and what year? I was born in 1954, and as far as where, I think it was uh, in Moorhead City. Okay. What community are you from? I'm from Jacksonville, North Carolina. You are? Yeah, my mother uh, married somebody from Jacksonville. So I'm not really sure if I was born in Moorhead City or maybe I think it was Moorhead City though. Uh huh. Because she's from Moorhead, you know. Okay. So she probably had a doctor here and went there, you know. I was, I was, you know, I wasn't real coherent at the time, you know. So how did you come to live down East Carter County? Well, my original father died, but he was a shrimper. He owned a gas station. He's a shrimper too, part-time shrimper. Out of Jacksonville? Yeah, mm -hmm. out of, out of uh, New River. Okay. And uh, because. My mother's from uh, Moorhead City. She knew the Down East area. After my original father died, she come back here and met somebody uh, that was a shrimper too. Okay. And I grew up after being in Jacksonville for, uh, I guess, four and a half years or so. Moved down here when I was almost five. Uh -huh. And uh, growing up at the head of Sleepy Creek on the water, stepfather of shrimper, you know. The head of Sleepy Creek? Yeah, you know. Down my way, down um, yeah. Gloucester? Yeah. Is that where you grew up? That's where I grew up, which, right at the head of Sleepy Creek. Which house? You know the house that says clam a lot? When you, yeah. Okay, we grew up in that little greenhouse at the head of that. I never knew that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, lived there ever since I was about five. And uh, had a good childhood, I thought. <laughs> well, what's your stepfather's name? Uh, his actual name is Alan Robinson, but he's better known as Froggy. That plays the fiddle? He plays guitar, not a fiddle. He's kind of a small Yeah, no, you don't call him Froggy because he's big. <laughs> Froggy's your stepdad. I never knew that. No, I'm sorry, but that's what it is. That's that's one of the people that first got Brian interested in playing music <laughs> and going to these fiddle festivals. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's my stepfather. And now, uh, what's your mother's name? Roberta. Used to be Pittman. Uh -huh. and then it was Robinson. Now it's Mason. Roberta Mason. Yeah. And so, are they still married? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. My stepfather and my mother broke up, I think, when I was about 21 or 2 or 3 or something like that there. Yeah. Are you still in touch with him, though? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see him every summer when I go south. So, he's still shrimping out of a No, he's a painter and, uh, uh, you know, a character of Rama Cullenville. Yeah. But, uh, uh. He used to shrimp down there a lot, and he went down there intending to retire shrimp and whatever, but uh, it just got so bad after Hugo, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. since everything's going down, he always, he's, he's a painter. So who taught you how to fish? Him, Froggy, mm -hmm. and my older brother, Jerry Kellum. Mm -hmm. he, he's into it heavy because he's a little older and, you know. So. Now, does Jerry still fish? No, Jerry's driving nails with Keith Hatter. Okay. okay. So he used to, and... He lost his boat during Hugo down in McCullumville, and he went down here after that. Oh. You know, and now he, he, he don't even do it. Well, he's got a small skiff. He messes at it, you know. So how old were you when you first started fishing? Probably uh, seven or eight, something like that. When I was old enough to pick something up that Froggy thought was useful, that's when I started. <laughs> hey. Yeah. You know, I worked with him uh, in the summertime. Uh, shrimping, he gave me twenty dollars a week. And back when I was a youngin, like seven, eight, nine, ten, right on up, that was a lot of money a lot for of a youngin, money. you know. And uh, then when I got married, I was laying carpet part time, and always ended up going back to the water, scalloping down south, uh, like Florida, mm -hmm. and then shrimp for my own. And once I shrimp my own boat for just a few years, I figured that's what I'm going to do. So. And and how old were you when you had your first boat of your own? Probably 18, 19, something like that. You know, just when I got out of high school. Uh -huh. Had a skiff or something before that, but you know, a boat with a motor in it you go actually and, and make money with. And what was the name of that boat? It had a number. I don't remember the number. Yeah. I, didn't, I, they didn't name a boat. The first boat that I named was... Uh, Probably the one that I got now, the Captain Woods. Uh -huh. The rest of them always had numbers, you know. Right. Well, they're not in a custom house. You name a boat in a custom house. You can put a name on any boat, I guess, but uh -huh. 
I didn't bother for that. I was just going through it, you know. And can you tell me how you got to be in Captain Booge for your boat? <laughs> well, my son, his name is Larry Kellum Jr., I gave him the nickname Booge from, he was probably, I don't know, three or four minutes old or something. And uh, when I got the boat, I bought it from uh, Bob uh, Austin. The name of the boat was uh, Charlotte. And they say it's bad luck to change the name of a, a boat, but uh, I knew right off I wanted to call it the Captain Booge. Because mm -hmm. one thing, it's unique, and uh, there's plenty of Charlottes around, but there's only one Captain Booge. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, That's you know. right. All right, so what we were saying... Um, you're talking about you named that boat after your son because that was a unique. And do you still call him Booge today? Booge. Booge. B O O G E. Booge. Booge. Just yeah. Because he looked like a little Booge when he was a little tiny. Baby. Oh, yeah, it's just something popped in my head and uh, <laughs> it kind of stuck with him for, you know, 21 and a half years now, I guess. Does he still Almost 22. Does he fish? He messed at it. Uh, of course, he done it when I was uh, bringing him up. He went. I think the first time when he was probably three years old that he remembers and, you know, he, when he could actually get out there and get in the culling tray, you know. Yeah. But uh, he, he, when he grew up all through his uh, childhood and through his uh, uh, high school, he would help me. So, yeah, he'd done it a little bit, and he had us. I gave him a boat, my smaller boat. I give him a, we call it a mighty vessel, mm -hmm. just a nickname that he got, you know, because it's little and it's, you know, whatever, but. So he's got a boat, and he has done it. But with the time he done it, times are so tough around Marshburg area, the price being cheap, the fuel was, well, it wasn't real high then, but still it was, it was you know. Uh, but now he's going to school. Anyway, he, he knows how to do it. He knows the basics. He's good help for me, but he's going to school, and I'm glad of it. Good. Where's he going? Uh, North at Drummond in uh, Newport News, Virginia. Is that um, welding or mechanical or something? It's uh, what they build, uh, battleships, aircraft carriers, you know, nuclear subs and stuff. Wow. And it's a four-year school, and they actually pay you to go. I mean, uh, I think currently he's making over $16 an hour to go to school. You can't be bad, can you? He wasn't around when I was going. I guess it was, but I didn't know about it. And that's what appealed to him. Instead of me having to pay money to him to go to college, he goes somewhere, works with his hands, welding, all kinds of different things. They teach him a little bit of everything, mm -hmm. and they pay him to go. He goes to class one day and then work another, and then class another, you know, whatever, just shift around. But right. uh, it's four-year school, and he's been about two years, uh -huh. and, and he likes it, uh -huh. you know, so. Yeah, that's good. That's good. What's that bird's name, by the way? Angel. Angel, okay. Angel, we're, we're capturing your every word. Just be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> So, Larry, can you tell me, when did the, the fishermen from Carter County start going down to McClellansville and fish shrimping down there? About when did that start? I heard it started back in the early 50s. The first I knew of it was about the middle 60s. Mm -hmm. My stepfather, Froggy, went. And uh, I think I went down there a couple times as a child, you know, just... Uh, Real young, like maybe 10 or 12 or something, you know. I didn't go with him shipping down there. He always carried some, some older person with him because it was a little more uh, uh, difficult, you know, to, to be away from home that long, you know, and, and to be away from school. When I worked around here, I could always go back to school or whatever, you know, be around the house. But down there, you go and stay two weeks at a time, you know, back then especially. Right. You know, just because, I don't know, just travel time, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh. So he went back in the 60s, early middle 60s, and then the first time I went was 1973. Mm -hmm. On my own little boat, and it was like a 22 foot boat, seven foot wide with a with a gas motor. We used to go for the bay opening. It's a Bulls Bay. Mm -hmm. It would open uh, every year, and every year we'd go down there and we'd catch a good pile of shrimp for just two or three weeks, and then come home. But uh, since I got a bigger boat. And they closed the bay probably in in the early 80s. I can't remember when it was. They closed the bay. Yeah. In other words, never opened it again. Oh, gotcha. The local people had it closed mm -hmm. through their influence. They closed it thinking that 
the Tar Heels, us, North Carolina men, wouldn't come down and work a six-mile line thinking they wouldn't pay off enough for us, and the shrimp would come out and they would get them all. Oh, so the local South Carolina fishermen wanted it closed to try to Try to stop North Carolina boats from coming down there and catching all their shrimp up in a mere week or two. Well, it kind of backfired on them because when they closed the bay, the Tar Heels still come down there and work, and instead of just lasting a week or two, now it lasts like three or four months. Yep. So now we stay down. I stay down there as long as four months some years, you know, just risk on green tails. Uh-huh. You know, go down in August and stay till January, you know. Yeah. So we really backfired on We used to go down there in September, stay two or three weeks and leave. And then they got all the cold water shrimp and everything else. But now, because of their greed, we go down there and stay sometimes all summer and sometimes, you know, just from August to January. Right. So that kind of blew up in their face, you know. You, so do you get along okay with them? Or are they... Well, they don't, they don't like us. I got friends down there that they are from South Carolina that I think the world of, and I guess they like me too. I stay with them a lot. And, but the, the shrimpers, the actual hardcore shrimpers, most of them were okay, but you got those two or three, just like I'm sure there's two or three around here that's the same way. You know, everybody's a son of a bitch, but down there you got them two or three that just don't like you just because you're from North Carolina. Right. They call you Tar Heels, and, and, you know, we're down there catching their shrimp, uh, taking up, you know, their, their, their livelihood. Right. You know, but uh, they don't realize is that they need us like we need them. Our numbers are dwindling so bad. When somebody falls out now, it's one less person to holler and scream about the regulations and, and, and whatever, you know. That's right. And uh, most of the crowd, they think that everybody getting out of the business is good for the business. They think it would be good for the ones that are left, but it ain't mm -hmm. because after a while you don't have a voice. Yep. When our numbers get so low that we're insignificant, we're history. Right. Because they've been trying since I've been thinking about it. They've been trying to get rid of us, the government has. Mm -hmm trying to weed us out, the, uh, the uh, pleasure fishermen, the uh, hook and liner, I call them, mm -hmm. they've been trying to get rid of me since day one because of the bycatch, because they think we're killing the fish, when probably the truth is we're probably helping it. Mm -hmm. The fish we kill probably feed other fish and make the numbers better. We catch the weak ones, the slow ones, and they, and they, they get eat. Crabs eat them, shrimp eat them, something eats them. I do know that since... Uh, since we started uh, getting the decline of shrimpers, less and less boats in Core Sound, area where I work a lot, the less boats you would think more shrimp, but it don't work out that way. The less boats that go, the less scrap fish go aboard, the less it draws them out to feed on the scrap fish. That's what I think. It's not been proven, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. Bare, the bare facts of it is less boats does not mean more shrimp. I caught more shrimp. 15, 20 years ago, when there was a load of boats, I'd done a lot better and got more money for them. Right. So, you yeah. know. Well, do you, do you think the state of South Carolina is friendlier to the fishermen than North Carolina, or is it about the same? How do those states compare? The state crowd, the, uh, the marine fishers of South Carolina, I get along good with them like I do here in North Carolina. I call them all the time, ask them questions about openings and stuff, you know, and, and this and that, and... Uh, I don't have any trouble with them. Mm -hmm. I think they're looking at the dollar signs. Um, they charge us $600 for license. Well, the state would be crazy to turn away that kind of money. Yeah. I mean, and plus, we bring money to the economy. When I stay in McCollumville, uh, I might bring some sandwich food or something with me when I go, but I buy a lot of food there, eat at their restaurants, buy their gas. Mm -hmm. I pay their state taxes on all the stuff I buy. And uh, so they're really, I mean, they're making out as much as if I was home and the people here making out for my benefit, you know. So. Uh -huh. How many um, North Carolina fishermen go down there anymore? Well, back in the, from the 70s and 80s, it was probably 20 or 30 small boats that went. And I would think... A lot of the big boats, I don't know how many because they scatter up and down the state and go to Georgia too, but uh, I would say the neighborhood of uh, 40 to 50 bigger boats. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, uh, last year I think it was probably around McCullumville, 
I'm guessing just uh, ten boats. That's all. Yeah, that went down there, and and we all kind of traveled down there together. Is it all from Carter County? That's probably about all from Carter County. Uh -huh. Probably probably ten boats. Uh, how about I mean small boats. Mm -hmm. There were some trawlers that you know they they have to go anywhere. You know trawlers uh, uh they got the uh, the fuel capacity to go up and down the coast, and uh, they're not they're not afraid of a small blow. You know. Right. Uh, so they could come and go a lot easier, and, and they come back and forth. Sometimes bring their shrimp home because they get more money, and sometimes just come home to be home. They run back and forth when they hear about shrimp. Yeah. When you hear somebody catch a shrimp somewhere, the big boat will take off and go, whereas the little boat will kind of lay right there and scrap, you know. Yeah. What do you consider a big boat and a little boat? What size are we talking about? Well, little boats uh, anywhere from 25 to 35, 40 foot, mm -hmm. and a big boat is... Uh, Anywhere from 60 to 70, 80, you know. So how big is your boat? About 35 foot. Uh -huh. Okay. So I'm, I call myself a little boat. Do you sleep on that boat when you're down there? I sleep, yeah. Sleep sometimes when I'm dragging. <laughs> 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 I catch a lot of good naps, you know, especially down in the sun shining on you, you know. Yeah. You make long toes, South Carolina, after you work on the deck. If you go in the cabin and lay there for an uh, uh, hour or two after you've done your work, you know, somebody's got you up for daylight mornings for a bunch of mornings in a row. Right. It's not hard to drift off, you know. Who's steering the boat? Well, when you're towing the boat, making two and a half knots. Oh yeah. And uh, the rigs more or less make it tow straight. You just get, you get her pointed, and uh, in South Carolina, the beauty of it is you can you can drag one direction for a couple hours in a lot of places, and so you can just let her go. Do you ever have to wake up another fisherman that's coming towards you because he's asleep? Yeah, yeah, I've had to do that, and they've had to do it to me the same way. How do you do it? Well, you take your radio, and you call the boys up. If you think you're about taking a nap, you say, listen, I'm going on channel so-and-so. If I get near you or somebody wants to holler at me and I'm getting your way, go on this channel and holler, and I'll have the radio turned up, right. and it'll wake you up. Yeah, because you're kind of on your toe. You're half asleep, maybe. You're kind well, of... you're nodding, what we call yeah. it. You know, your eyes are shut, and if somebody says something on the radio, like uh, if you, somebody calls your name, it'll wake you up. And if somebody has a good try, that'll wake you up, you know. But, right. <laughs> but you know, yeah, you're like you're not in a in a real deep sleep. And there, you you shrimp during the day, right? You shrimp daylight hours, and that's what's appealing to me because you sleep nights like a white man. You know, you you sun up to sun down. Uh huh. And at the sundown, you either go in the creek and anchor up, cook yourself something to eat, and and you know just leave your rigs out. Just it's a lot less work. And if you really if you get a fair tide in or Want to go to the dock to go to a restaurant to eat or something? It, it's not very far, you know. Maybe uh, the furthest place is probably an hour and twenty minutes, and the closest place is probably uh, uh, less than an hour to okay. get into the dock. Tied to the dock, plug into the dock, AC running, you know. But the downside is everybody wants to get up early the next morning and go out. So, and you got to get up early to get out there for sun up, and it's a rat race when you get it with. Seven or eight, ten other boats, and everybody's in a hurry. I mean, you know, it just yeah. complicates things. Well, you're telling me that some of the they call us Tar Heels. What do you call them? Uh, I don't know. I think they they got names uh down there that well, I don't call them that because uh I don't get into that thing, you know. But they call them like Blue Bloods. Some of them, the, the higher class ones, have got the bigger boats. Blue Bloods. Call them Blue Bloods. You know, like royalty or something. You know. And I've heard them call herself Gucci's. Oh, yeah, I've heard that. And uh, I don't know. I'm sure there's more, but I, I don't pay attention a lot of times. Okay. Well, you said that the South Carolina shrimpers are interested in buying up the boats that Carter County and North Carolina fishermen are selling because people are getting out of fishing here. Why is it bad here and it's not there? Well, South Carolina... They, the way they talk about us, you would think they wouldn't want anything we had. Mm -hmm. You would think the hell with them, they're, uh, just just leave them alone, you know, stay clear of them. But the fact of the matter is, North Carolina make the best boats. Mm -hmm. We rig them up the best. Mm -hmm. I ain't saying the best everywhere, but if you compare North and South Carolina, the proof is in the pudding. When you got people from South Carolina coming here and buying your boats and coming to your boat and looking at it and then changing the way they do things, the way you do things, what does that tell you? It means you're doing, you got a better idea, and it's easier work. Uh, when we first went down to South Carolina, 
back in uh, 73, none of the boys there had a culling tray. None of them. Hmm. They dumped their stuff right on deck, and they get down on all fours or get down on a little chair or a stool or a box or something and cull off the deck. Yeah. Out there in the hot sun off the deck, bent over. Gosh. Well, we come down there, and they see us standing up to a coal box, shoving the stuff off the back. They had to, to shovel things through a scuffle hole. And, you know, but it's just the bending over is yeah. what gets it. Now, after, it took a few years. Uh-huh. I mean, they didn't grab right a hold of it. They were kind of stubborn, you know. But after a few years, I'll say after 10 years, now all of them's got culling trays, cull boxes. Okay. So they can stand up and look upright, you know, yeah. instead of crawling around on a deck, you know, and, and your knees are going, your back's going. Uh, they, they give that up. Now most of them have culling trays and cull boxes and stuff, you know. Right. But what I'm asking is, how come f- fishermen are getting out of the business here because times are so hard, but not there? Oh, they are. They're getting out of oh, it there, too. Are? Yeah, okay. they're getting out of it, too. And and uh, uh, some people have called me and asked for about boats around here, but they want it more or less as a side thing. Okay. It's people that have other jobs. Mm-hmm. And like I say, boats are cheap right here now, and they're good boats. They are. You know, and the bare fact is people in South Carolina are not boat builders like they are around here. Mm-hmm. And, uh, in fact, we got I got one fellow that comes from South Carolina, travels uh, probably 50 hours or close to 60 hours of travel time to pull his boat up here. They got a railway there just three hours from his dock. But he runs, instead of running six hours round trip, he runs 60 just to pull his boat up right here in Gloucester there to, uh... At, at um, Lloyd's? Lloyd Piggott's, yep. How about that? Yeah, he certainly does. That's and, uh, and uh, the other crowd is the same way. They'll come here and buy a boat and take it back. A lot of the ones, a lot of the worst ones that talk the worst about us own North Carolina boats, bought them from North Carolina people, and learned most of what they learned from us, yeah. and yet still badmouth us. <laughs> Mostly because we probably make them look bad catching shrimp, you know. Right. Because the best shrimpers compared to South Carolina, most of them are from North Carolina, mm-hmm. working down there. Yeah. They got shrimpers in South Carolina that are good too. Right. But uh, they didn't build their own boats and they didn't rig them up. Uh-huh. They go other places and buy boats and come back there to catch shrimp. Ah, uh, okay. Now, who do you think are the best boat builders around here? Who built your boat? Uh, Bob Austin built my boat. He built himself for, his, for himself. Bob Austin? Bob Austin that lives down. You know Bob, lives there yeah. to Wilston, yeah. He built that boat. Sure did. Oh. Building his backyard. Wow. Okay. So, see, there's a lot of people here. I mean, I can't build a boat. Uh-huh. But I can take one that's built and keep it up just like oh. it was built, you know. I can I can copy somebody else's work. Yeah. But uh, no, there's a lot of good boat builders. I mean, uh, probably Clarence uh, Guthrie's probably the best one. Is that Harper's Island? Yeah. Uh-huh. He's probably the best one I know of, you know, but... Uh, there's there's dozens around here, and there's none in South Carolina. That's interesting. I wonder why that is. Because they have all that, they have that nice pine forest, the Francis Marion Forest, where these guys used to get all their lumber. Well, I don't know where to get the lumber at here, but uh, it's just a tradition. I I don't, I've, I've heard that uh, the Tar Heels went to South Carolina and taught them how to catch shrimp. Really? They, they weren't shrimpers. Before we were, we were shrimpers first and went down there and then they seen us, how we're doing it and started copying. I, this is what I've been told. I, I can't prove it, but right. uh, just from going around McCullough and Owendall area, uh-huh. uh, it was the North Carolina men that got them started huh. and they still don't like us. <laughs> They've made livelihoods from us and got our boats and everything and, and, and we made it easier and all you ever done is help them. Have they ever been nasty to you, like cutting your line or anything, or done anything like that, or they just talk about you? Nah, they just talk about you. Yeah. Talk about you on the radio. Some of them uh, have thrown stuff out behind the lines and stuff where the Tar Heels drag. Some uh-huh. of them fudge the line, and some of them throw out steel things that would tear your nets up. Uh, yeah. And there's been nets tore up. Uh-huh. Some of them's gone there and welded big drawing rods through uh, 55-gallon drums, fill them full of concrete, and roll them off the boat, or put engine blocks out there. Gosh. At nighttime and weekends when we're home, and then we go back, and of course they put them behind the line, you know, and and then they sit and wait for somebody from Tar Heel to go fudge that line, and you put it fifty yards behind the line, if you might catches it, 
And he tired Ned up. Well, then, you know, he was behind the line, and he deserved it. That's what they're thinking. But, right, right. well, see, then they catch it and drag it out in, in, in legal bottom, and then everybody catches it. Oh, gosh. Yeah. A 55-gallon drum full of concrete and, and steel spikes. You know, tire your net up, forward through your net. Well, then, then it's lost, and someone else catches it. Have you ever caught that? I've caught stuff, but not like that. I mean, yeah. I've caught other things, natural things, more or less. I, yeah. I, I, I don't go behind the line if I can help it. You Have know. you ever caught something unusual? Well, I've caught outboard motors. I've caught uh, anchors, big anchors, you know, like yeah. like old schooner anchors. You know, I've caught a couple of them. And uh, I don't know. That's about it, I reckon. Now, you were down there during Hugo, right? Yeah. What happened? Uh, Hugo was like, I think, 550 miles away, and we was headed out that morning to go surfing, me and my brother, and I turned the radio on the VHF and listened to it, and it said Hugo was 550 miles away, hadn't turned, was headed straight for Charleston, and it had been two or three days, hadn't turned or quivered, it, it was drawing a bead line on Charleston. <laughs> well, I figured, you know, 550 miles away, making 20 miles an hour, I did the math. Next day or so, it was going to be there. I had been checking around. I found me a little place. There's a lot of creeks in South Carolina. And uh, so I called my brother up and told him, so I'm going to go in and go up the head of this creek behind that cemetery I picked out. And he said, well, I'm going shrimping. I said, well, look now, that storm's 550 miles away. It's making 20 miles an hour. It'll be here tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. He said, well, I'm not worried about no little storm. I'm going shrimping. So he went shrimping, and I went up the creek and put my boat behind a cemetery that was a creek that was turned against the grain of the creek that you originally go up in, and my boat was fine. My brother, on the other hand, tied to the fish house dock and lost his boat. He caught like 65 pounds of shrimp that day. So for that 65 pounds of shrimp, he lost a, probably a $10,000 boat at the time. Was he on that boat? Did he stay on her? He was on another boat. At he was dock? on a at the dock. Him and his wife and his little girl. Oh my gosh. Not real bright. So what happened to them? Were they okay? They ended up going to the head of the creek after a big barge come down Jeremy Creek. The barge was left to the front of the creek by one of them local boys there. I can't remember his name, it was Ori something. And he knew the boat the barge was there. Wasn't anchored or nothing. Well, when the surge come in, it picked the barge up. The barge was probably 25 or 30 foot wide and probably 100 feet long, something like that. It was a big barge for putting a crane on. It floated down the creek, hitting bank to bank, tearing boats loose as it went. And when it came up there, it hit a boat that my brother was tied to and knocked the stern out of it. So he had to cut the boat he was on loose. He was on a steel boat about 45 foot, and he wouldn't think it was going to get that bad, but it was really, really bad. The surge in McCullumville was 14 and a half feet above mean high water. And when he when he cut her loose, he was in full reverse. The motor he, he was running the motor he was on just to hold her to the dock because mm -hmm. the surge was running by him like rapids. Mm -hmm. And he had the boat he was on in reverse trying to hold her to the dock, plus she was tied too. But when that barge came and hit the boat, and sunk the one that he was tied to, he had to cut loose. And even though he was going full reverse, he said he went to the head of that creek the fastest he ever went. Oh, my gosh. In full reverse. Just a surge of the water was carrying through there. Well, he ended up to the head of the creek in the tree, in the, in the, in the pine trees. I was, the surge had already come in probably 10 or 12 feet. So he was above where normally you couldn't even go. You, you could walk normally. But he ended up, he was in the pine tops. And he said when he saw the pine trees around him, he took her out of reverse, put her in forward, and run her in the pine trees as far as he could. Uh -huh. And then after the surgery, he got up in her as far as he could go. Well, when he had planned to, to back the boat back out, when uh, uh, when the surge, you know, when the surge started going back out, he was going to let her ease on out just a little bit and kind of hold his own. Well, he fell asleep. He woke up that that morning. He heard pine limbs are breaking. That was that steel boat breaking down through the trees. So he ended up. In the woods. He tried to back her out then, but it was too late. She'd already settled down because the water left faster than it come, really. And that was a steel boat? He was 
it was a 45 foot steel buck, but it wasn't very wide. It wasn't a real good choice of places to stay, but yeah. once you make that kind of choice, you can't leave. So did he, was he able to roll her back in the water eventually? Well, the fellow that owned the boat, uh, uh, he, was, he was staying on another fellow's boat because it was bigger. Mm -hmm. He had his boat tied to the dock thinking that he could take care of his boat and all the boats in the area, you know, hold them, kind of work on them, you know, keep pumps going and whatever. Right. Because we've been through storms at McCullumville since, but that was a direct hit and it got the full brunt of the storm. And uh, that was a whole lot worse. I've been there several times myself on boats. So, I mean, you know, but that one there was just yeah. a different animal. And so you stayed on your boat that night, right? No, no, no. no Larry was in Betty, sitting on the couch. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yeah. I went and put my boat up to a heavy creek, went to the fish house, settled up, got my money, and then come home. Okay. Bubby stayed down there. Bubby was in the walking mall. That's what I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah, Bubby right. stayed on his boat in the walking mall, which was still a long ways from the from the worst of it, but it was still bad. Right. And Bubby's got a big boat. It wasn't the same thing as staying in McCullumville where it was really bad. So when you went back, was your boat just fine? Yeah, more or less. It had, uh, I tied to eight different trees at the head of a canal that was narrow enough I could jump from the side of the boat to the bank. And I tied to eight different trees, and four of them blowed down. But they were still there. Mm -hmm. So the surge come through, but I was against the grain around the corner from the surge. Okay. And uh, never really had any damage at all. Were there other boats around you? Oh, yeah. In fact, the only boats that really survived without being hurt was the ones that went to the same place I went. Hmm. But I looked for two days to find that place. Yeah. And last one, the local boys, hey, I'm... I'm looking for a place to put my boat if the storm comes, you know, which, like I say, then it was three or four days away. Mm -hmm. And I had me a place picked out, and it actually paid off. And, in fact, when I come out that day, it was me and about three or four other small boats. My The boat I was on, on then was 26 foot. Oh. And the boats that went up that little creek with me was anywhere from 26 to 30 foot. Mm -hmm. And when we come out of that creek, there was 80-foot trawlers on the highway. And you could see the crowd gathered all around looking, and I could tell they were wondering how in the hell did that little boat stand it when 80-foot yeah. trawlers is on the highway walking around, people walking around them. Phew. But it pays to really look for a good spot. Yeah. Did that storm change the way you could make a living down there? Did it change everything? Or did it well, it did. Uh, uh, I went out about three days after the storm. I went out shrimping, and there was no beacons anywhere. And with no beacons, it's hard to find your way out because all the creeks look the same. Mm -hmm. It washed everything that was a marker, washed it all away. Hmm. In fact, it was the reason I went out three days after the storm because I walked around for two days just in awe of everything that I'd seen. Yeah. And finally, I said, well, shoot, I'm going to go check it out. So I went out there and checked it out, and it's the most shrimp I've ever caught in my life was after Hugo. Really? There was shrimp in mud puddles. Out on Highway 17, there was shrimp all over McCullumville for several days after the storm where salt water was left puddled here and there. There was shrimp jumping in mud puddles two and three days after the storm. And cause it was, the surge carried a bunch of shrimp up in there, and then when it left out, it carried a bunch back out, but it deposited some in the woods. Everywhere you went, there was shrimp. Gosh. But that year, the, uh, the South Carolina Marine Fisheries had put... 5,000, I believe it was 5,000 rose shrimp in Bulls Bay. They went out there with a barge, had them in a big tank, and they were trying something. They were going to see if they could help seed the rose shrimp season. So they had 5,000 mature rose shrimp full of eggs and put them out in Bulls Bay. And that's the most shrimp I ever caught in my life was that year. And I think it's a lot to do with that, and they haven't done that since. I wonder why they didn't do it anymore. The funding wasn't there. I don't know. I never I never have uh, really asked anybody about it, but th that was one year they did that just to see what would happen. And then Hugo came, and I think their record keeping wasn't very good after that. They didn't realize that there was that many shrimp yeah. caught because McCullumville and all the boats around Charleston were devastated so bad, that, and the fish houses. I mean, I had to bring my shrimp home. So I was going to ask you, how would you sell it? Well, the shrimp... The fish houses was uh, was closed because there was three weeks before they got power to McCullumville after the storm. So there was no way to eat packed shrimp. 
we went and caught the shrimp and come and, and put them in our trucks and coolers and then run them back to North Carolina, sell them, and then go back and get another load. Mm -hmm. I made two loads a week. Two, I mean, I made, worked two days, fill my truck up, bring them home, and go back, work two more days, fill my truck up, come back. Right. I'd done that for like, uh, I believe it was a month and a half before Rhett Leland got his fish house going. Mm -hmm. And then we sold shrimp to him. But for the first month and a half after Hugo, we had to drag our stuff back. Whereas the trawlers, the bigger boats, they come from all over and caught the shrimp. And then because there's no fish houses, they carried them back to North Carolina or Georgia, wherever they went. Or even, I guess, South South Carolina, you know, like around uh, Buford, they, they probably were all right because they were on the backside of the storm. But uh, that's why I think the fishers didn't realize how much that helped because there was no records of it. Oh, yeah. I mean, even even the records of the shrimp that was caught up to that time, everything was flooded around McCullumville, so any records they had, it was, you know, it was right. gone. losing fish houses there like we are. I mean, you know, Clayton Fulcher's closed down, Atlantic, and shut their Harker's Island fish house, and there's no fish houses on Harker's Island. Is that is that the case down there, too, at least in McClellanville? Well, they've lost uh, a lot of docking because of uh, development. Mm -hmm. Rhett Leland owns a lot of area on the creek, and he had a, uh, it was like a fish house at the head of the creek, I mean, yeah, to the mouth of the creek, and he had another one down okay. toward the head of the creek. Well, the one to the mouth of the creek, he sold, and he's developed that. Oh, okay. Uh, whereas it used to be a lot of docking for the Tar Heels. He would let them tie it. It was like uh, 200 foot of dock, uh -huh. maybe 300. You know, foot of dock. A lot of boats could tie there, three or four breaths, you know. So, uh, yeah, uh, that one fish house there is gone, and there's been uh, reduced docking. Mm -hmm. uh, the fish house I go to, uh, uh, Bill Livingston Seafood, used to be Bulls Bay Seafood, but now it's Livingston Bulls Bay Seafood. Uh, he can probably dock 13, 14 boats. And Rent Leland can probably dock uh, 25 or 30, maybe is that, 40. Is that enough for everybody? No, not really. I mean, uh, some boats go to Georgetown. Some of them uh, uh, anchor out and come in and sell some stuff there and then, then go back out. I mean, some of them just pass through. But right. No, there used to be... Uh, they used to be probably 60 or 70 boats in McCullumville. Wow. The other dock would hold a lot of them. See, they lost a lot of linear dock. Uh -huh. And they, like I said, they would tie three or four breaths. So if you got uh, 250 or so feet of dock and then all of a sudden you don't have it, mm -hmm. well, then there's a lot of boats can't tie there. Yeah. But they just go to Georgetown or Charleston or wherever, but, you know. Right. But it did cut down a lot of docking in McCullumville. But there's still two fish houses there like it always was, just that one man had more or less two fish houses. He's okay. still there, but he cut one them out. So in the last, say, five or ten years, have you had to change the way you do go about your business because of the way the market is and yeah. regulations? And well, say used to. Uh, South Carolina had a better price than here. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. They used to, uh, well, I've got as high as $7.25 for tails. Really? Or 16 20 at tails. At a fish house? At a fish house. This was back in... Uh, I guess uh, late 70s, early 80s, they were paying, uh, they used to have to head everything. That was, that was the way it was, Cyclone, you headed everything, and they paid by tails, uh -huh. by tail weight. And uh, it was not uncommon to get anywhere from 650, like I say, up to 725 a pound for shrimp. Mm -hmm. Well, if you caught 100 pounds a day, and you even got 600 pounds for them, and fuel was... 40 cent or 50 cent Jeez, and you burn 25 30 gallons of fuel well you've got uh, 15 dollars in fuel and you made 600 dollars that's right you know for picking up 100 pounds of shrimp yeah well now because of imports and uh pond grown shrimp however you want to look at it and the cost of fuel now i take my shrimp and bring them home and sell them here when shrimp here are scarce. Shrimp here tend to tend to die out about the time I go south in August, September. Uh -huh. Shrimp here is on its last legs by by the end of September, middle of November. Shrimp in here is more or less over with for the big shrimp. Well, that's when you catch your big shrimp there. Okay. And I bring a lot of shrimp home. And my wife's a dealer. She, we sell shrimp to people for their freezer. Mm -hmm. 
and it's a small operation. I'll bring anywhere from 500 to 700 pounds at a time home, headed shrimp, and, you know, sell just enough to the fish house there to cover expenses, cover my fuel, my ice yeah. fuel and stuff, you know. Sell them a few, but right. uh, for the better price, but there's there seems to be two prices now. You got the, the breader price is like, uh, well, last year it got as low as a dollar and ten cent for sixteen twenties. Shoot. The breader price. Mm -hmm. The fish house man sells to the public or sells uh, uh, to the uh, the peddler market. Mm -hmm. The peddler market we got two dollars and twenty cent last year. Is the peddler market the people that end up selling it on the road? Right. The roadside you got you got people that come there and buy from the fish house. They pay upwards of two sixty, I guess. I think it's two sixty. Because the fish house man makes forty dollars a box, sometimes fifty, mm -hmm. so they might pay two sixty, two seventy for the shrimp, and they'll go and sell them on the side of the road for, I don't know what, probably three or four dollars. Right. But the, if the man peddles them, he he pays us two twenty for sixteen twenty. Oh, okay. But if they go to the breader, mm -hmm. well, then you get anywhere from like say anywhere from a dollar ten last year to a dollar fifty five is what the price was, and the dollar fifty five didn't last very long. And that can't even pay for your fuel hardly, can it? Well, fuel was as high as two dollars and eighty-five cent, yeah. and shrimp was a dollar and ten cent, and I burn all day long. I'll burn at least fifty gallons. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at a hundred and forty dollars a day yeah. to go shrimping all day long. Well, if you don't catch but two boxes of shrimp at a dollar and ten cent, you got two hundred twenty dollars. You take a hundred forty out of that. If you blow a spotlight bulb or something breaks. You don't make much money. No, no. So, you know, but, yeah, I do. I have changed because now I tend to peddle more shrimp mm -hmm. and make a little bit more that way. Plus, it gives the people a better quality shrimp for better than they can do. Okay. So they get a good deal, too. So you don't go down there till August then, late summer. What do you do up here in the meantime? What well, now, sometimes I go for roast shrimp season. Like right now, uh -huh. tomorrow, uh -huh. they open up as part of the roast shrimp season. It's a, they call it a provisional line. It opens around three miles from the beach. And I got a notice today in the mail from South Carolina mm -hmm. notifying me that the season starts tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Oh. Now, I found out today at 1 o'clock it takes 27 hours to run there. Oh, your boat is here? Yeah. Okay. So I'm not yeah. going for this. For this, they got a provisional opening, and then they got an opening that goes all the way to the beach, mm -hmm. and that's the that's the the, the, the actual season starting okay, okay. when they open it to the beach. Well, I called out there and talked to the fisheries, to the crustacean management, and I tell them my situation. So look, I'm you might as well say I'm uh, uh, 30 hours away. From the time I find out, it would take me 30 hours if I had my bags packed and everything on the boat ready to get to where you are. Mm -hmm. And I found out uh, less than a day in advance. Yeah, that's not good. In other words, if I hadn't, if I don't call down there and get somebody there to call me and tell me, I mean, they knew this information, they knew this a week ago. And I knew about it because I called down there. Mm -hmm. But if you wait for them to send you the notice oh, right. to the Tar Heels, you'll never make the opening. Mm -hmm. You'll never make it on time. So you have to call. You had to anticipate when it's going to be. And I'm lucky. I got a fellow there that I've been talking to for the last 30 years. And uh, I've never met him. All I did was talk to him on the phone. Mm -hmm. But we talked back and forth. He asked me questions about here, and I asked him questions about there. But he will call me and tell me, say, Larry, it opens on so-and-so a date. And he's a shrimper? No, he works at the Marine Fisheries. Oh, that's that is crustacean lucky. management. Yeah, well, you've never met him in person. Never met him in person. How about that? I've awesome. seen him on the History Channel <laughs> for Save Our History, the Shrimpers, you know, on there. Yeah. I've seen him on there a couple times, <laughs> but I've talked to him for over thirty years. Wow. And but, but he knows me, and he's got my cell phone number and stuff. Yeah. And he realizes, you know, what I'm talking about. I, I like to have five or six days' notice, like right. the boys in South Carolina got. Yeah. I mean, they'll put a notice up in the fish house. You could get the fish house man to call you, and you'll get it three or four days' notice. But I just get the main man to call me, and he tells me, hey, you're the first one. In fact, last year, he called me up 
when they decided when they were going to do it, he called me up first mm-hmm. and told me, he said, hey, it opens up on so-and-so a day and so-and-so a time. Well, I had several friends that wanted to know. One of them was Jimmy Hancock. Mm-hmm. Now, he was down there off of uh, Hilton Head, I believe, or somewhere to the southern. I called him on his cell phone and said, Jimmy, it opens up next week at so-and-so a date. He, in turn, tells people on the radio, and it travels from the south part of South Carolina, travels from the radio back to McCullumville to people there that found out from me. The fishers man called me, told me. I told somebody in South Carolina uh-huh. that was a North Carolina shrimper that was probably 80 miles to the southern of them. It traveled back on the VHF radio, and they got it. Well, a fellow going in went into a store and told the crowd there, said, hey, Larry Kellum says it's going to open up on so-and-so a date. And that's when it opened. How about that? So the crowd of McCullumville found out from me, Yeah. which I called about several people and let them know, hey, the word's out. You know, I, I tell everybody, and then it branches out from there. I say, hey, call your friends and tell them because I don't want anybody to be late or miss an opening. Because of not knowing. Yeah. I mean, anybody, even if I don't like them, they ask me, so when is it open? I'll tell them. Uh-huh. Because I realize you need the numbers. Oh, and yeah. if somebody goes down there and catches a load of shrimp, he might stay in the season a little while longer and help our numbers well, because okay. our numbers are going. I know. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, when you're not, Around here, do you do any? You do some oystering and stuff, don't you? Or? Yeah, I mess with oystering. I uh, uh-huh. I got a lease that I relay polluted oysters sometime in, and uh-huh. and I, I do that some. But uh, I shrimp here too. I shrimp in Core Sound. Oh, okay. I've been shrimping for uh, about a week, really. So uh, I do side jobs welding. Uh, oh, you've been shrimping already for a week, you said? Yeah, worked last week. Oh, how'd you do? Uh, I had uh, about let's see, a hundred. 130 pound one night, 140 pound one night, and uh, a little better than 100 pound one night. But when you first start, you tend to, there's always a lot of little things to do, like like you make adjustments on your rig. Yeah. But the main adjustment you make is going from sleeping nights to staying up nights. Oh, yeah, that's hard, isn't it? Well, it didn't used to be hard. <laughs> but like I said, I was born in 1954. <laughs> so if you do the math right, you know. Yeah. You know how old I am, so it gets it gets harder to stay up all night long. Do you go with anybody? The, you know, I I I'm I'm the one. By yourself? Oh yeah. You, not in South Carolina though. Oh yeah. Really, you're it. I'm the main source of energy here. You don't have a boy on your culling table in South Carolina. When, on the opening, sometimes when my son when he didn't go to school, I carried him sometimes okay. for a week for the opening. Because you catch more shrimp most of the time on the opening, and you actually need more help picking them up. But after, after the opening's over with, and after, well, even even now, I mean, if I, if I go to the opening, I just do the best I can. Right. If I catch more than I can handle, I just stop and, and take care of it, you know. Yeah. But just uh, but no, I'm I'm the I'm the crew. So in shrimping here in Core Sound, have you noticed a lot of less people out there with you nowadays? Or oh yeah. What's the difference? Well. Just for instance, uh, <clears throat> say 20 years ago, mm-hmm. there was probably <clears throat> 75 to 150 boats in Core Sound. Hmm. You can leave Marshallburg and look to the northeast, get off of Marshburg, you can see a line of sight. Mm-hmm. You would see 15 to 20 boats between Marshburg and Davis. Mm-hmm. You see a small fleet off of Davis, probably 15 or 20 boats. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you would see... Atlantic would look like a city. Hmm. Atlantic, you can see nothing but solid lights across it. Wow. And I've seen as many as 100 to 200 boats to Atlantic on the full moon in July when the shrimp are running. Wow. And they were all in front of each other, neck to neck, I mean, side to side, going down, everybody catching shrimp. Yeah. And, uh, but, yeah, there's a big difference. Now, well, last year, for instance, when I went, the first month that I went last year, out in Core Sound, I went off the of Davis Shore. It was me, it was Robert Dean, and Bernie Willis. Three of us. Was the only ones working. I knew it for a month. Three of us. Uh, out of 
Marshallburg? Everybody out of Marshallburg Harbor? Out of everywhere. I saw all I seen was three boats. Oh, my gosh. You're kidding me. Three boats in the sound. Most of the crowd don't get started. Like, if you go early, you know, you're going you're gonna to see that. Yeah. And a lot of years, I've been the first boat out just from just from wanting to go. Yeah. Sometimes the middle of February, if it warms up, I went. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you catch shrimp. You always got a good price because you're the only one going. Right. There was a big demand for them. And even now, even 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 this year, the boys got two dollars a pound for head-on shrimp, little shrimp, mm -hmm. which is a good price. Right. But still, fuel was, yeah. you know, over two dollars a gallon. Right. So that kind of that kind of messes it up. I remember in the past working nights, I mean, dragging for a peck of shrimp, which is about 15 pounds, make a lot of peck drags, mm -hmm. make five or six peck drags, and end up with 75 or 90 pounds all night long, hard as you could go, and make money mm -hmm. because fuel was 35, 40, 50 cent, yeah. and shrimp was two and a quarter. Mm -hmm. You get a box a night, you pay your little piddly fuel bill, well, you made you $150 a right, night. Right, right. And that was good money mm -hmm. and something you love to do, you know. But now, if you get if you don't get 40 pounds of drag and get at least a dollar seventy five for them, you're not doing much. Yeah. You know, because you had to do the math. Right. You had to stop and think what you're doing. I mean, it's not the same thing. You, you can't just go out there and they're what they say, throw her and tow her. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about her, just keep her tight. You know, you can't yeah. do that anymore because you end up with a big fuel bill mm -hmm. and no way to pay it. Right, you better know that there's something there. Well, you got, like I said, if you're out there and you're burning, it cost me roughly about $10 an hour to run my boat. Mm -hmm. That's what it costs, just for fuel. $10 an hour, uh-huh. So if you're out there and you catch 20 pounds of shrimp at a dollar a pound, well, then you made $20 and you got $10 yeah. on fuel. If you made a one-hour drag, well, you don't make a one-hour drag. You make an hour and a half dry, you got 15 in fuel and $5 in shrimp. Oh, right. So you got, it all depends what the price is. Mm -hmm. When you first start, it starts out at 2 and it goes down like this. Last week it went down to $1.75. Well, have you thought about getting out of shrimping and going into different other fisheries, you know, like drop net, ocean drop net fisheries or anything like that? Or? <laughs> Maybe for a nanosecond or something. I don't know. Not very long. You just love shrimp. Oh, I like to catch shrimp. That's what I like yeah, to do. It's, yeah. That's what I've always done. And uh, I mean, I like to catch oysters because I like to eat oysters. Yeah. I mean, you know, I sell a few right now and then, but uh, I just like the shrimp. Uh huh. Now, have you ever brought an observer on board with you? Have you ever worked with scientists? Or oh yeah, yeah. How's that work out? Well, let's see. I've carried people out that that said they was gonna help the fishery, and end up hurting it. Not intentionally, maybe. Yeah. Like one girl, Galen Johnson, uh, she she come there and got a hold of me through Bob Austin. Mm -hmm. He knew her, and she was uh, doing something with the marine fisheries, doing a study for them to get credit for some college thing, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, she came to me and said that she wanted to, she wanted to go shrimping with me, it was her and, and, and another girl and a feller, young feller. I can't remember their names, but they were going to go, and they wanted to document the shrimp that I caught and the fish. Well, I'm thinking right away, you know, there's a bycatch thing going on here, so I'm already pulling feds, you know, fish excluders, yeah. and I'm pulling teds, turtle excluders, right. and I'm thinking, wait a minute now, you know, uh, uh, what's this going to do? She said, no, I'm trying to prove that the bycatch you're catching, the fish mm -hmm. and stuff you're throwing overboard, I want to prove that hard crabs are eating them. Okay. And I say, hey, I know the fish are getting to eat. Mm -hmm. Hard crabs eat them, shrimp eat them, and the fish eat them. Mm -hmm. But you're going to prove it. She said, oh, yeah, I want to prove that the bycatch that you throw back is not being wasted. Okay. I'm thinking, hey, that's a good thing. Because if you catch a few fish and you throw them back, and that feeds something. It's like fertilizer. It's like a farmer going out and fertilizing his field. Mm -hmm. It produces. In other words, you're taking fertilizer, putting it out there. It's helping something else grow. That's what you do when you throw scrap out. And uh, so I said, okay. But they were going to pay me for, for, my, for my lost time. Mm -hmm. They would pay me, I think it was $60 a tow. Which I'm thinking, hey, you know, I might, make out, might not make out too bad here. So I agreed to it. And... The deal was I had to make at least 
at least two toes every night. If I went and made one toe, it didn't count. I had to make at least two mm-hmm. or three. They wanted three toes a night. Okay. That, 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 they, would, that they would document. Mm-hmm. And the way they documented was they kept track of the toe time, and they asked me where I drug at when I, I told them. And we'd make a certain toe in a certain place, and we haul back. I would dump the stuff in the culling tray, and they would take and save all the fish and weigh them. I would pick the shrimp out, and sometimes they'd help me, mm-hmm. especially early in the evening. I mean, you know, they'd, they'd help. Yeah. After two or three o'clock, they kind of they kind of phased out. You know, they were they were like 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 little babies. You know, they were yeah. they, they were sleepy headed, <laughs> but. Anyway, they helped all the kids, so we we took all the fish and saved them, and they had scales, they weighed them. Well, they took shrimp, and they weighed them, so they were getting, they were documenting how many shrimp I caught, and how many fish I caught, and how many crabs I caught. Mm-hmm. And the other things, too, like sow duds, other things, the grass and stuff, they were taking all that and writing it all down, doing all kind of extensive study, you know. Right. And they would measure the fish and weigh individual fish. They were real particular about it. And... I happened to be at a meeting. It was probably two years later. My wife was on a committee for the fisheries thing. They had that thing where they're having, I can't remember what it was they called it. but Yeah. But yeah. Anyway, they, they were having a meeting, and she was there. The sh- that shrimp. Um, the shrimp, shrimp management shrimp plant. plant. The shrimp man- so yeah. This was kind of recent. Oh, yeah, it was like a couple years ago. Yeah, okay. So I carried her, say, a year or two before that, huh. and she went. I think 10 times, I believe. Yeah. And we did that. And she had all her documents and stuff. And I told her, I said, I want to know how you make out. I want to know if this proves anything at all. And uh, so anyway, a year or two later, I'm at this fisheries management meeting, mm-hmm. shrimp plan meeting. Mm-hmm. My wife was on, the, was on the committee. so I, And she told me that Galen Johnson was going to be there that night. Mm-hmm. I said, hey, I'm going. I want to hear this. Mm-hmm. Because she went with me, and she went with some other people, too. That's right. But she went with me ten times, and she went with somebody else probably ten times. But anyway, I wanted to hear the results. This was this was the thing she was going to do. Well, she got up there at the meeting and gave her a little presentation. She had a little uh, film thing going on there, you know, and had... PowerPoint. Yeah, was pointing out this and that, telling how many shrimp we caught, how many fish we caught, and what kinds of fish they were. Well, turns out that she documented me catching a whole lot more fish than I did shrimp, which that's, that's the way it is. Mm-hmm. You're going to catch more fish most of the time. There's times when you catch nothing but shrimp. Mm-hmm. But then again, there's times yeah. when you're going to catch fish. Well, when she got up and gave her things, she told how many fish we caught, what kinds there were, and how many shrimp we caught, and, and the Horatio to it. I can't remember the specifics of it. But what it all boiled down to is, it was inconclusive. And I'm thinking, wait a minute now. You've done this for two years. You went with me out there, and you were going to prove this and that. And it's inconclusive. The only thing she really did prove was how many fish I caught. Yeah, that's probably what stuck in people's heads. Right. Yeah. Well, this was the committee that was going to manage the shrimping plan. Did you raise your hand and ask Well, I asked, I asked her a few questions, you know, about this and that. But the bottom line... At the end of her presentation was the evidence was inconclusive. Mm-hmm. She couldn't prove that the fish were being eaten by hard crabs or anything else. Now, she took hard crabs, supposedly, and dissected them, and was going to tell what they had in their belly. Mm-hmm. And she was going to say, well, if they had spots or pinfish or whatever it was in their belly, and we were catching spots or pinfish, and we caught the crab and the fish in the same place, you can only assume that the crab was eating the fish, mm-hmm. but it was inconclusive. Only thing that was certain was how many fish I caught and how many shrimp I caught, right. and that was out there. So I felt cheated. Yeah. Did you tell her that afterwards? Uh, I never got a chance to talk to her. Yeah. She was scary. You think she was nervous to see you there? Uh, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I didn't. I wasn't going to threaten the girl. I mean, yeah. you know. I mean, but. Uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, she was uh, doing what uh, she wanted to do, I guess. And uh, But it, it, she didn't lead me to believe that it was going to be inconclusive. She thought, well, I'm going to prove right, that, this right. is, that this is what happens. And uh, yeah. 
She didn't prove it. Well, do you think that the scientists have an accurate understanding of, you know, the environment through their studies? Or are they looking at different things? They just know about different things in the fishermen? Or how does that compare? My opinion. Uh -huh. My opinion is that they're really in the dark. Mm -hmm. They don't know things that are obvious, like Galen Johnson trying to prove that the hard crabs were eating the fish. I mean, if I go to my dock and I back into my slip and I cull out my last tow and I rake my stuff over the side of the boat and it's only like a foot deep there on the side of my boat. My boat lays in a hole at our dock. Mm -hmm. Well, when I rake the stuff overboard, you can see the stuff there, especially in the wintertime when the water's clear. The next day, most of it's gone. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, fish do not disappear in cool water from one day to the next. Something is eating that fish. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't melt away that quick. They would eventually melt, you know, just decay away. Right. But especially in cold water, when you first start shrimping, and I explained that to her and told her, say, hey, I know it'd be a fact because I see stuff disappearing. Right. And you look down there, if you look down there real good, the next day you'll see crabs, fish and shrimp eating on that dead stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I knew it and it was like me to be simple to prove yeah. but it was inconclusive. <laughs> but I mean, just that's just an example of, yeah. of, of some of the stuff I mean, and uh, a good example of what goes on with the marine fisheries is the fish excluders, the feds. Yeah, I was going to ask you, did you work with those tests? Well, uh, I had a friend that did. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Lewis did it. And the way they do it is they take, first they try to get two nets identical catching the same. When you get your nets catching, you know, pretty much the same, you drag them around for two or three nights and, and, and you document, you catch 20 pound this net and 19 the other net and then it's vice versa. I mean, you document that your nets catch the same. Well, then you start trying uh, fish excluders. Mm -hmm. what, you, what you're trying to prove is that you can exclude the fish and keep the shrimp. Mm -hmm. Well, they uh, they take and get a net that catches the same, and they put a fish excluder in it, sometimes on the top of the bag, sometimes off to the side of the bag, but at different heights up and down the bag. Mm -hmm. Same deal with me. They, they pay the person for his time, and uh, they document just one bag with a fed in it, other bag without a fed. So both nets caught the same, well, the one without a fed, if it caught 10 pounds of shrimp on a drag, and the one with a fed caught 10 pounds of shrimp and less fish, mm -hmm. that's what they were trying to prove. That's what they were trying to do. Right. So what they did start with was they, they did that, and they did some tests, and they figured out the size of a fed and where to put it at in a net, and all of it was, as far as I'm concerned, for nothing. Mm -hmm. We pull feds now, and... When we get any amount of fish, we cut the tail bag below the fed. The feds don't do what they're supposed to do? The feds might let out a few fish. Yeah. All the f fish excluder does is put a device in your net that you have to maintain. And they'll change it for a lot of years or they changed it mm -hmm. every year. Well, they want you to make them out of stainless. In other words, you got, these things cost 15, 20 bucks a piece. Well, you say, well, that's nothing. But I've got six or seven tail bags, mm -hmm. or it takes 30 minutes to put one in. Now, my time is valuable like yours is valuable. Well, the bottom line is all the testing they've done, they got these feds, and everybody pulls them. And right now, the feds are, uh, I think, seven feet up on a 10 foot bag. All right? If I catch any amount of fish, I go three feet up on a 10 foot bag. And cut ten marshes, and that gets rid of the fish. So you know, it's just sort of there as a showpiece, and meanwhile, you do what needs to be done. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we did this back in the '60s when my father was shrimping. I shrimped my father mm -hmm. back in the '60s, in the fall and the spring of the year when the fish are bad. Right. If we caught a big bag of fish, he says, "Son, I'll fix that." He'd go there and count thirty-five marshes up that bag for where he tie it, and cut ten marshes. Well, then you catch a whole lot cleaner. 
Right now, my tail bags of Marshburg Harbor are cut 13 inches gash, uh -huh. three feet up, and you catch a whole lot less fish. So all they all, all the testing they done, paying the shrimpers for lost time, thousands of dollars, hundreds of man hours, mm -hmm. and something we were taking care of anyway. Right. I don't want to catch fish. I don't want to pick the weight up. I don't want to kill fish. I don't want to handle fish if I don't have to. Yeah. But the plain aggravation of keeping that fed up to regulation was just a pain in the butt for a lot of years. Now they've settled on something. Mm -hmm. They got them six inch square, I think. They started out three inch square, four inch square, then four and a half, then five. And right now, I mean, we pull them. And they might help a little bit, but whenever we get any amount of fish that hurts us, we do our own thing. Mm -hmm. We don't, I mean, that thing stays in there all the time, and it probably does help a little bit. Well, what about the um, turtle excluders? Did you participate in those studies? Uh, no, not really. I, uh, I tried to get out pulling them as I could. Yeah. The fact of the matter is they will exclude turtles. Mm -hmm. But you do lose shrimp, too. Yeah. But... The turtles didn't used to be a problem. I mean, we used to catch them, you turn them loose. If you caught one, most of the time it messed your bag up a little bit, but, I mean, you know, it was just part of the game. Now turtles are getting so thick that they're eating the crab potter's bait. They go to a crab pot with the bait well in it, mm -hmm. and they'll eat it up. Crab potters are complaining about the turtles eating their pots, tearing out their equipment. And the last years I was sink net, I used to do that when I was sink netting. You couldn't set a, a fish net or gill net in the hook of the cape without the turtle eating the fish. Oh my God. You come to a trout that was a foot long, foot and a half long, big pretty trout, and he'd be bit right in half. A turtle, like a half moon bite with out of it, right. you, knew, you knew a turtle done it. The oh. turtles were so thick you couldn't set a net without losing a bunch of fish. So. Now what do you like shrimping? <laughs> yeah, well, the turtles, well, like I said, the scooter does work. It does yeah. shoot the turtles. Right. But uh, there's, there's a lot of headache comes with it, not to mention the cost of a, of a, of a good turtle scooter. Right. They cost uh, in the neighborhood of 250 275 mm -hmm. They wear out. You have to maintain them. Yeah. It's another piece of equipment. Yeah. All right, we'll finish up here, Larry. All right. Fishing stories you'd like to share with us? Have you ever been in a in a um, caught in a storm or anything, or had a hard situation that you got out of? Or? <laughs> yeah, I got one. I got one right. that I was in. I was I was real close to a tornado, a water spout. There's a tornado on land, water spout on water, whatever. I remember it was uh, probably in 1980, 83 or 84. No, it had to be 83, because 84 and 85, I didn't go to South Carolina. Only two years since 1973, I didn't go to South Carolina, hmm. was 84 and 85. Wow, why not? I, there was no shrimp those years. Oh, okay. I told you about the guy that I called. Yeah, that's right, okay. Well, he, he's crustacean management. He tells me if there's shrimp or if there's no shrimp. And those two years, he told me not to go down there, hmm. and he was right. Wow. So anyway, it was in 83, I believe. It might have been a year or two before. It was in that, in that time frame. I was off of South Santee, a shrimping, and the sky got real dark off to the western, which is towards uh, Isle of Palms, that area, Mount Pleasant area. Mm -hmm. I'm talking deep purple black, you know, like that there. Yeah. And I could tell that it was a really hot day. I could tell something was going to happen. So uh, I turned on my VHF radio. Now I'm shrimping probably a mile, mile and a half off the beach in a 26-foot boat. My brother's out there in a in a 30-foot boat. George Brown's out there in the Ronda Sioux boat. Used to be Ronda Sioux boat. She's probably 40-foot, something like that. Another friend of mine is out there in a a 60-foot boat. We're all out there dragging together, and I turn my VHF on. When I turn it on, I hear this real loud buzzing noise. It's that there 
warning system they got where they had oh. they buzz, you know? Yeah. Well, after the buzzing ended, they come on there and go tell them about a tornado or a water spout and a severe thunderstorm that was, it was in Isle of Palms moving northeast. But Isle of Palms is southwest of where I was at, so it was coming my way. Anyway, it gave out the time of day, and it said it was moving northeast at 75 miles an hour. Wow. Well, the time of day was like just 10 minutes earlier than what it was right at the time. I'm thinking, well, that's it. It's coming my way. So I go on the radio, switch back off of that, call my brother up and say, listen, there's a tornado or a water spout, however you want to call it, in Isle of Palms. 10 minutes ago, heading northeast at 75 miles an hour. It said for all boats in this path, they mentioned Bulls Bay and they mentioned South Santee on the radio. It said all, all boaters in this path should seek safe harbor immediately. Mm -hmm. And I told my brother, and it didn't seem to worry him. He, he's one of them kind. He said, man, don't be afraid. Just like you go. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I haul back immediately and start steaming towards the beach because this is coming at an angle that would put it coming off the beach. So I'm trying to get next to the beach so that it would block me off, mm -hmm. block, the, block the bad weather off of me. Well, I haul back, and I'm on a 26-foot boat, and I steam towards the beach. And as I'm going that way, I bring my nets inside the boat. I tie the doors down. Cause I'm on a small boat now, and this thing is blowing 75, 80 mile an hour. And it's got strobe lightning. If you've never seen it, it's like a strobe light. Really? Strobe lightning is like this here. I mean, it's, it's bolts of lightning popping down uh, just as if it was a, a, a spark plug sparking. Mm -hmm. And that was coming at us, and the sky was getting really dark. Well, the other crowd are on bigger boats, and they're all short a little further. They didn't haul back. None of them hauled back. But I, because I was on a smaller boat, I headed shore. I was, I was thinking, I'm going to run on the beach if I have to. Yeah. So I run up there, and I get behind the beach. And before I get to it, though, the first wave of it hits me. And this, the other crowd is like a mile and a half behind me offshore. Well, it hits me first because I'm closest to it, closest to the shore. Mm -hmm. Well, it comes like just like a wave, like a shock wave. You've seen shock waves leave a bomb or something? Yeah. It comes right at you. A drive in the rain. Now, I had a camera. I was going to take a picture of a water spout, I thought. I had a camera laying right there beside me. And when the first wave come, it's blowing like probably just 10 or 15 miles an hour to start with that day. Well, when that first wave comes, hits me, I estimate it was blowing 25, 30 mile an hour. Well, you know, it comes and the solid rain comes with it. And I called a crowd up and ready. I said, boys, it's blowing about 25, 30 off the beach, and it's raining cats and dogs. Oh, man, we're not worried about it. Just don't don't be afraid. Okay, well, I'm steaming toward the beach still. I'm probably half a mile off the beach, and I see another wave coming, just as distinguished as the first one. It's coming, and when it hits my boat, now I'm estimating it's blowing 50 or 60. It takes the boat and turns her sideways, bows her around, and waves are breaking on the cabin of the boat, over the bow of the boat, on my little boat. I'm only half a mile off the beach. It's blowing off the beach. Oh, my gosh. So the wind is blowing so hard, it's making waves break on, on the bow of my boat. So I call my brother up again and say, look, now it's blowing 50 or 60 miles an hour. He's still saying, oh, man, don't be worried about that. It's, it's going to blow over just a minute, you know. So, okay. So I'm there now going to the beach, so close, I'm bumping bottom. I mean, my boat don't draw but two and a half foot of water, so I'm in shallow water. Mm -hmm. Anyway, a tornado, when it goes by you, it don't just blow one direction. It makes a clockwise, it makes a circle. The wind goes in a complete circle. Mm -hmm. As it's coming to you, it's blowing one direction. As it gets up to you, it comes from another direction. When it goes by you, it blows from another direction. Okay. So it comes all directions. So the wind was blowing off the beach. Well, then it got close enough. Another wave hit me. Now it's blowing 75 or 80 mile an hour, which is a, it's a you know, F1 or something. 
tornado. Yeah. Anyway, called the boys up then. Well, then now they felt the shock wave for the second time. Mm -hmm. So then they're saying, man, it's bad here. It's breaking <laughs> over the cabin, this and that. So uh, they're kind of sorry they didn't haul back. But meanwhile, I'm dealing with my own stuff. It's so bad, I'm bumping bottom, which is, like I say, two and a half, three foot of water. The waves, I'm bumping bottom. And waves are breaking over the bow of the boat onto the cabin. Now, it, there can't be much water there because I'm only in three foot of water. Gosh. But it's blowing so hard, the waves are breaking on top of the cabin. So now it's not blowing off the beach. Now it's blowing down the beach. Uh -huh. So now I've got their header down the beach and go down it, and the waves are coming from, a, from the whole length of the... Uh, the long way. The long way, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it goes right on around. It keeps on going. After a while, I'm heading offshore. Meanwhile, my brother offshore fouled his rigs up, pulled one net in two. He got so bad he ran her wide open, and the boat was diving so bad, it was so rough, he tore a net up. George Brown says the worst time he'd ever been in, mm -hmm. and another guy named Larry Garner was out there in a 60-foot boat, and he said he wished he'd have gone in there with me. And it blows 75, 80 miles an hour. Well, sure enough, my brother was right. It only lasted about 15 minutes. But 15 minutes seemed like a long time when it's blowing 75, 80 miles. I imagine. What I'm lying is I didn't really get my picture took. I was so busy trying to keep the boat straight, I couldn't get a picture. Which I never, I never did see it rain so yeah. hard, and the wave action was so bad, I couldn't see. Very, all I could see was was just images of the of the shore, and that was about it. Huh. Wow. So that was about the worst time I'd ever been in. But uh, I noticed uh, as much as two and three weeks after that. When the sky got dark, and when I went in, a lot of people followed me in mm -hmm. because it was a bad time that yeah. day. And they, uh, <laughs> they you well, if I'd, if I'd have stayed where I was at, the boat would have sank. Oh, yeah. Because I was in the smallest boat. Mm -hmm. They were in bigger boats, but they took a bad beating. Yeah. <clears throat> and even the ones with bigger boats, they quit and come in a few weeks after that when the, when the sky got dark because right. they were just, they were gunshot. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, no, that's it. You ask the questions, I answer them. <laughs> well, I appreciate you taking all this time this afternoon.